So, uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my affiliation still does say Berkeley, I know, but, uh, but I will be here, I promise, July 1st, uh, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you then. This, uh, as Baron said, uh, I am uh, uh, a graduate student, a graduate of uh, uh, Stanford, and uh, I uh, happen to know this room very, very well because this is where I defended my thesis. So uh, <laughs> it's nice to be back here for that. Um, I want to talk today about some of the tools that we've been developing in my group on uh, helping storytellers, tools that are designed to make it easier to tell stories. And uh, before I start, I just want to say that all of the work that I'll show you today was done in very close collaboration with a number of students, postdocs, and colleagues. And their names are listed here at the bottom of the slide, and you'll see their names again over the course of this talk. So when I accidentally say that uh, you know, I did something over the course of the talk, what you should really be thinking is that there was a graduate student or a postdoc who was doing all of the hard work. So I think that the combination of this device with websites like Facebook and YouTube have completely changed the way that we capture and share uh, audiovisual stories. So today, we're at the point where the best stories can be viewed billions of times. In fact, uh, this video, I think, recently cro crossed the uh, 2 billion view mark. Um, and, and that's pretty incredible when you stop to think about it. 2 billion times this thing has been viewed. Um, but creating these kinds of high quality stories, it really requires paying careful attention to the story design, to the editing, and to the production. And of course, it's not just entertainment. This TED video was posted in September of 2013. And in a little under a month, it had been viewed over 300,000 times. And, uh, here again, the people who created the video paid very careful attention to designing the content as well as the editing and the production to tell the story effectively. But of course, most of the videos that we share on Facebook and YouTube today, they don't look like these, right? Most internet videos look more like this. So uh, as we learned here at Stanford, most internet videos contain cats. And, uh, and this is an example of uh, two girls telling the story of finding this cat on their front porch. And this video does contain some really nice moments, interactions between the sisters and the cat. But there's also a lot of mumbling and awkward noises as these girls figure out exactly what they want to say. Six views now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, we, we've increased the total number of views. <laughs> um, there's a great site on YouTube. Have you seen Petite Tube? So it's this website that's dedicated to showing uh, YouTube videos that have exactly zero views. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and the cool thing about it is that as soon as you view a video, you know, it no longer can be part of the site. So, so it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. So, you know, this thing has these nice moments, but at three minutes in length, it, it, it also feels just really long. And it could benefit from some editing. But the question here is why? Why don't we edit these kinds of videos? And I think a big reason is that today's video editing interfaces look like this. And I don't know about you, but uh, I've been working with computers for a very long time. I'm a computer science professor, and I find this kind of interface to be completely intimidating. In fact, what I'll argue later is that it's not just the surface complexity of these interfaces, uh, but that these interfaces use the wrong underlying representation. And that's what makes them really difficult to use. They force users to work and focus on frame level details rather than on constructing the overall story. And so most people just don't take the time and effort to learn to use these things. And so here's the challenge. The statistics suggest that people really want to capture and share audiovisual stories. 
But as we've seen, the raw media itself usually just isn't that compelling. Often it's, it's just really long. On the other hand, the best stories are carefully planned out, edited, and produced. Yet the current video editing tools are really hard to use. So what I think we need are higher level tools for creating audiovisual stories. Tools that allow the storyteller to focus on constructing the narrative, or what uh, Kurt Vonnegut calls the overall shape of the story. And meanwhile, the computer should handle the lower level details of managing the media and putting it all together. And so uh, what I want to do is show you some of the approaches that we've been taking in my group to develop these kinds of storytelling tools. The first approach that I'll show you uh, focuses on analyzing the content of audio or video of the raw media to identify semantically meaningful features and then allows users to edit the media using these semantic features. And I'll show you how we've applied this approach in two, domain, uh, two domains, one for editing interview videos and one for editing audio stories. Um, and then uh, I'll show you a second approach where we've built tools that uh, leverage existing skills, skills like drawing that people learn from a very, very young age to help uh, users construct animated stories. Uh, in particular, I'll show you a project on creating animation via puppetry. So let's start with the first uh, project. This is on interview video. And, um, what we're really talking about here are talking head style videos. Uh, this kind of video is extremely common. You see it all the time yeah, in yeah. broadcast news, uh, talk shows, promotional videos, and uh, documentaries. Right? So it's a fixed camera, a person just talking in front of the camera, uh, uh, telling you a story or telling you uh, various facts and so on. Now, editing this kind of video is really challenging. The raw footage often will contain hours and hours of material that has to be edited down to just a few minutes in the final cut. So in our work, we like to start by examining current practice. How do people edit videos today? Well, it turns out that there are three main steps. So, the first step is for the editor to build an index. And what the editor does is uh, he'll transcribe the speech and mark the associated times. This is called logging. Uh, and uh, it's done uh, very, very often in this kind of media manipulation. And the index is incredibly important because it makes it easy to find specific content. But of course, building this index is extremely time consuming. Log logging is one of the most dreadful jobs in, the, in this kind of work. All right, next the editor has to find good places to cut the video. So here uh, you wanna find places where the speaker is not in the middle of a gesture, not in the middle of saying a word, right? Those are, those are better places to cut. And uh, here's an example where the cut breaks the visual flow because it occurs in the middle of a hand gesture. Now you'll be able to have much more creative layouts and the text will be able to flow across all of those regions. Okay, so these kinds of jumps can be really, really jarring and we want to avoid them. So finding good cut locations, again, often requires scrubbing back and forth through the video to find these good locations. Finally, the editor has to insert a transition between the frames, between the, between the remaining video segments. And uh, there are standard kinds of visible transitions, jump cuts, fades, zooms, that we're all really familiar with. And uh, each of these kinds of transitions has a well-established meaning. So for example, a fade often implies a passage of time. Now, in some cases, the editor might not want to produce a strong visual break and would prefer to smoothly transition between the segments. Interpolation is one approach for uh, creating such hidden transitions. And so here's an example of interpolation. And uh, 
in most cases, simple optical flow-based transition produces something that doesn't really work. If the distance between the frames, if the two uh, end frames are too far apart from each other, it's very difficult to smoothly interpolate between them, and you get this kind of effect where the hands kind of melt into the frame. So, uh, so this isn't so good. <laughs> So you, you know, so what you end up doing if you really want a hidden transition is to pick a, uh, to pick segments that are very, very close to one another, and in most cases you just don't end up using these kinds of hidden transitions. So all three of the steps that I've outlined are problematic, uh, and our work is going to address all three of them. <coughs> but the first two steps are especially tedious, and. Um, I think that the underlying cause is that current video editing interfaces all use a frame-based representation of the video. So users have to index the video and find good cut locations by repeatedly scrubbing back and forth through a timeline. And that's where a lot of the tedium comes in. How many of you have edited video? Okay, almost everyone here. Uh, and uh, I think you all agree that a lot of the time is really spent just scrubbing back and forth through the timeline to figure out exactly where you want to cut. <clears throat> now, most people don't think of interview video in terms of frames or time code. They think of interviews in terms of the video content. Uh, and for these kinds of interviews, the content are the words and the sentences and paragraphs that the user is or the speaker is speaking. And so our goal is to let users navigate and edit these kinds of videos using a transcript-based representation. We want to make it as easy as word processing to edit the videos. And so here's what our interface looks like. Uh, it has three windows, a standard video player, a standard timeline view, and this new transcript view. And the transcript is time aligned with the video. Uh, and this makes it really easy to find and play back uh, the footage that corresponds to this highlighted text. And just to show you the synchronization, uh, here I'll play a little bit back. OK, so it's really uh, uh, very well aligned. And uh, our transcript view actually looks like this where we mark ums and repeated words in red, and we also introduce these vertical blue bars. And these uh, bars indicate places where the system thinks it can make a uh, seamless hidden transition, where it thinks that you know, if you make a cut at one of those locations, it can bridge the cut with a hidden transition that will look totally smooth. And these visualizations are really important because, again, they help you reduce the amount of time you spend scrubbing. You can obviously read the text, but you can also find the repeated words that you might want to cut out, the uhs and ums that you might want to cut out, uh, and you can figure out where to place a cut uh, and still produce a hidden transition. So for the hidden transition, Manish, uh, so you need to mark something in the transcript and then it comes up with all the other um, you know, maybe destination points of the for the cut or yeah, is uh, how it works. Or? No, so it's it's done uh, a priori, and I'll explain how it works a little better as we move forward. But um, this is you know it's done once at the beginning. Okay. Uh, we figure so out. I mean, it seems it seems like you know for any particular point in the video there's mm -hmm. going to be a bunch of points where you could splice it together. That's right. And if you pick another point, it's going to be uh, different points. Again. Yeah, and so that's a, that's a great direction for future work. We did a simpler thing, and I'll, I'll explain it as we go on. Yep. OK, so uh, now that we have this set up, the editor can cut, copy, paste the text to edit the video. So here uh, I remove a phrase, I just select it and uh, press delete, and then our system is going to generate a hidden transition. Okay, so I'll play that transition in a second. Watch the hands, they should move very, very s uh, smoothly across the cut. Of making a story. 
okay? And just to compare, here's the jump cut version of that. And in this case, you will see the hands uh, 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 jump very visibly. I'm making a story. Okay, it's right at the end. And uh, just again for comparison, here's the smooth version. All right, and I'll show you more examples in a second. But that's the kind of effect that we're after. We want to make it so that you can easily edit the text, generate the new video, and uh, produce this smooth hidden transition. All right, so our interface is based on three main algorithmic components, uh, one for building the transcript-based index, one for computing this uh, cut suitability, or the blue bars, and one for computing the hidden transitions after you've specified a cut. And I'll briefly show you uh, all three of these. So first step is building an index, and uh, we start with the raw video, and we obtain a verbatim transcript using the crowdsourcing service Rev.com. And this costs about a dollar a minute, but the nice thing about Rev is that uh, it produces this transcript that includes all of the uhs and ums and stutters in the speech. So it's completely verbatim, and that's really useful when we're aligning this transcript to the speech itself. Now, we found that this kind of uh, crowdsourcing approach is much, much more accurate than automatic speech to text. Um, in the future, you could imagine, of course, that this would be replaced by automatic <coughs> speech to text, but currently we don't think it's at the, uh, it's, it's high enough quality. So, um, to uh, align the transcript to the video, we use an audio model of phonemes as well as of pauses and breaths. And then we apply a uh, forced alignment algorithm that is based on an underlying hidden Markov model to do the alignment of the text, the transcript, to the speech in the video. And this produces that transcript view that I showed you earlier. Okay, next we compute these cut suitability scores and we use these scores to place the vertical blue bars where a cut is most likely to lead to a smooth hidden transition. So here's how it works. Uh, remember that <coughs> editors prefer to place cuts where the speaker is not gesturing and is not speaking. So to identify potential cut locations, we assign a cut suitability score to each frame of the raw video. And uh, this combines an audio score and a visual score. So let's start with the visual score. We first compute a kind of frame distance uh, between uh, 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 frames that are in the sequence. And the distance includes a spatial component and an appearance component. And um, the spatial distance is computed first by running a face tracker. In this case, we run uh, Saragi's facial feature tracking algorithm. And this provides a set of facial landmark points that mark the eyes, the nose, the <laughs> mouth, and the contour of the face. And uh, then we set the spatial distance as <coughs> just the distance between the centroids of these landmark points. So it's a very, very simple way to capture the motion of the head. Okay. Now for the appearance distance, we compute uh, histograms of oriented gradients, or hog features, around the eyes and mouth of the speaker. And we also use the position of the face to estimate the position of the body and compute hog features in, uh, in this region as well, over here. And the body features are really crucial for our application because uh, it's usually in this region that the person, the speaker, is making all of the hand gestures. And so we want to capture changes of, in appearance that occur in front of the body. And the distance is then just set as the uh, normalized chi-square distance between, uh, well, for these feature vectors. All right. So, 
Now we have to convert this uh, appearance distance into a cut suitability score. So we do this by taking each raw frame of the video and comparing it to a reference frame where we know that the speaker is not gesturing and not in the middle of speaking. And video producers often capture these kinds of reference frames uh, at the beginning of the raw footage, where the speaker is simply listening to an off-camera interviewer uh, asking a question. So we have these reference frames. They're really easy to find. They're often right at the beginning of the, of the raw footage. And uh, note also that the score is set high when uh, the distance to the reference is low. So we're trying to, you know, good places to cut are places where the score is high. So that gives us an appearance distance. We also have an audio score. <coughs> and here uh, we, uh, we rely on uh, alignment between the transcript and the speech and set the score to one wherever the speaker is between words. All right. And uh, finally, we uh, combine the visual and audio scores and threshold the result, and that gives us these good cut locations. All right, so to get back to your question, Bernd, we're uh, essentially finding the places where the person is not speaking or gesturing. <coughs> and that can be done once at the beginning. Okay, and, and that of course generates these, the, the blue bars. All right, now finally our system needs to generate these hidden transitions. And uh, uh, the goal here is to take a jump cut that looks like this and turn it into a hidden transition that looks like this. All right, so one way to compute this transition is to build a complete graph in which each node is a frame in the raw footage, and edge weights encode that frame distance that I showed you earlier, that distance that represents you know, how similar two frames are. And uh, given the start and end frames of a cut, we can then apply a shortest path algorithm to uh, compute the smoothest set of in-between frames. That's a, that's a general approach. And that approach can work quite well, except that that, ex, that approach is very, very costly. All right? That approach has uh, order n squared complexity. Uh, and with tens of thousands of input frames, you'll wait all day long, <laughs> well, for weeks or months, for this thing to, to finish computing the shortest path. Uh, and it just isn't very effective. So this brute force approach is not the right way to go. Instead, we're going to start by clustering the <coughs> raw footage frames hierarchically using a greedy algorithm. And then uh, we're going to use a, a hierarchical shortest path algorithm to compute the, uh, the smooth transition path. So we start by taking all of the frames and building uh, large top level clusters and then further subdividing each of these clusters until we get down to the individual frames. And then uh, we approximate the shortest path in a top-down manner. So we start with the top-level cluster centers and build a matrix of pairwise distances between these clusters. All right? So that gives us a, you know, the, the distances at the very top. And then we compute the shortest path just at this top level. In this case, the path is starts at C1, goes to C2, and then goes to C4, right? So, <clears throat> so this is a much smaller graph, and it's much easier to compute the shortest path for this uh, top-level set of clusters. We then refine our distance matrix by first adding all of the orange edges between subclusters. And um, we then uh, add these cross-cluster gray edges. And this refinement is done in such a way that when we compute the shortest path at this refined level, it'll follow the sequence of clusters computed at the higher level. All right? So uh, we repeat this process all the way down until we reach the finest level of the hierarchy. All right? And that is, uh, in practice, much, much faster 
than the order n squared complexity of the brute force approach. In fact, in practice, what we found is that in many cases, this, uh, this greedy approach, this hierarchical approach, uh, approaches linear complexity rather than the n squared complexity of the, of the other approach. All right, so uh, just getting back to what we're trying to do, this is the jump cut. And when we compute our shortest path transition, this is what we get. All right, now this transition appears a lot smoother than the jump cut. But the woman's head is also moving a bit too fast. Right? It doesn't look natural. Uh, and, uh, and this is a problem. And so we're going to do a bit more to address the timing of this transition. So uh, in order to fix the timing, we start with the two end frames of the cut. And uh, we use our hierarchical shortest path algorithm to, to obtain this set of in-between frames. All right, So that's just as before. Um, and to slow down the transition, we can take any pair of frames on the shortest path, and we can insert additional frames using optical flow interpolation, the kind of interpolation I showed you at the very beginning. And because these frames are pretty close together, it, uh, you know, optical flow interpolation will now work for these frames. And so uh, the question here is how many of these additional frames should we insert? Should we insert one frame, two frames, three frames, four frames? How many should we insert in order to get the timing of the motion to look, uh, to look reasonable, to look good? Um, and uh, here we take a data-driven approach to solve this problem. And the way we do it is we take the original frames in the raw footage, and we consider uh, pairs of frames, i and j, <coughs> and we build a uh, histogram that relates the number of in-between frames, n, to the frame distance, that uh, appearance distance that I showed you earlier, uh, uh, d, between these frames. Okay, so that gives us this histogram. And then uh, for adjacent frames in the transition path, we can uh, take the two frames, compute the frame distance between them. In this case, d is equal to 3.6. We can look up the corresponding row in the histogram we just created and um, set n, the number of in-between frames, to the value of the bin containing the, the, the distance. All right? So this is essentially doing a, a kind of maximum likelihood estimate of the number of frames that you should insert. And uh, when we do that, that gives you a much better looking hidden transition. So here's the result. Right? The timing just is, is much more natural looking. OK, so let me show you a few more results. Uh, first, with jump cuts. All right, and I didn't talk about it, but one of the things that our algorithm can do is uh, just the way that we bridge transitions smoothly, we can also add in pauses that look natural. And the pauses are really important for highlighting parts of the speech. So here's an example. OK. Uh, here's uh, another result. And here's the result. Keep your boasting until you have beaten, said the tortoise. Shall we race? So of course this fits, and I start with me. The hare darted out of sight at once, but soon saw. And to show his contempt for the tortoise, lay down to have a nap. Tortoise plodded on and plodded on. OK, one last example. Eight and nine grade, and the basic idea 
girl that motivated this exhibit was her uh, hair. And the result. Okay, so that gives you a sense of what the system can do. <clears throat> and um, I should mention, of course, that there are some limitations to the work. Uh, first, our system really has to transition uh, between, well, there, there are limits to how far, uh, how different the two end frames can be for a transition to work. So in this case, the system has to transition between a frame in which the hands are uh, not visible to one in which they are visible. And the hierarchical, gra hierarchical graph that we create just doesn't contain a smooth transition path to bridge the cut. And so we get this funny looking result. Um, so the more raw footage that we have, the better the result can be. Now, our, uh, assumption, our, our system also does rely on a few assumptions. It assumes that the background is fixed, the lighting is fixed, uh, and that the camera is stationary. Uh, and if you violate these assumptions, the system will produce uh, results that are not so good. <laughs> um, and, and that's you know, a great direction for future work. Now, in building these kinds of tools, I think it's really, really important to evaluate them with target users. And so we showed our interface to nine professionals, video editors and working journalists from the Berkeley School of Journalism. And overall, their feedback was uh, really pretty positive. They thought that the system would fit well in their existing workflows. And this indicates that they could easily adopt the approach. And so we were really, really happy about that because uh, you know, they wanted to take the transcript-based editing in particular and just use it right away. Um, they also thought that our uh, approach for producing hidden transitions was a new useful alternative to producing visible transitions, which is commonly what uh, video editors have to do. They did note, however, that the uh, hidden transitions would probably be best for online videos. Uh, but at higher resolutions, they noticed some blurriness in our results. And if you look carefully, I think you probably saw that. Um, again, this is a, a direction for future work to get, you know, to get rid of that blurriness and make these things look really high resolution. All right, so to me, the overall takeaway from this project is that choosing the right representation can make an interface much, much easier to use. How do we choose the right representation? Well, we pick the one that matches the user's conceptual model of the content. And for interview videos, the transcript representation is a much better match to the way people think about these videos than a frame-based representation. And uh, I think this relates to what cognitive psychologist Barbara Tversky calls the principle of congruence. She says that for effective interfaces, the structure of the external representation used by the interface should match the user's mental representation of the interface. And she originally stated this in the context of visualization, but I think it applies equally well to interface design. And, um, uh, you know, it, it, it also relates to earlier ideas from Don Norman and his colleagues. They said that uh, interfaces in which the system's model matches the user's conceptual model reduces the gulfs of execution and evaluation. So these systems tend to be just much, much easier to use. Now, I think one open question is, what are the appropriate representations for other kinds of video? This transcript representation is great for interview video where a lot of the content is carried through the speech. But how do people mentally think about videos that are less focused on speech, that are focused on the actions or the visuals? What representations are appropriate for those kinds of videos? Uh, and that's, a, I think, a really important question and one that we should, we should all be thinking about. 
All right, beyond interview video, another very powerful medium for storytelling is audio. Before you move uh, yeah. to audio, and maybe that's the perfect segue question, yeah. actually. Yeah. What did you, uh, you know, for the video interviews, do with the audio? Uh, yeah. Did, did you do anything uh, special there? I mean, cer certainly for the pauses, uh, you needed something to fill in there yeah. to make it uh, sound natural. Yeah. Of course, there are good algorithms also to warp the timeline uh, for, for, for audio now. So are you, did you build in any of those into the system? Yeah, good question. So how do we handle audio? So. Um, so we tried to cut between, you know, between words in the, in the audio. So we didn't really do anything special there. We kind of faded in and out the audio at those, at those transitions. Um, we also had uh, uh, what's called room tone. <laughs> it's something that editors record at the beginning of uh, taking video or audio. Uh, and it's just a recording of the ambient sound. Uh, and so we would use that to fill in pauses and you know other gaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Other other thoughts or, or questions? Okay. <coughs> so we've recently been developing tools for editing audio stories and. Um, you know, these kinds of stories are very commonly heard on radio shows, in audiobooks, and in podcasts. And um, I've been interested in the way that these stories use editing and production to really engage listeners. In fact, uh, I spent 2012-2013 uh, on sabbatical uh, working with producers at Studio 360 uh, a public radio program that's produced by WNYC in New York. And I did this to really better understand the techniques that radio producers use to tell very compelling stories. Uh, and it was a great experience. If you ever get a chance to do something that's outside of your normal you know, computer science or whatever you do, I highly recommend it. You, you learn a lot. <laughs> Now, uh, along the way, I also uh, found published resources like this book from the creators of This American Life and websites that describe design principles for creating effective audio stories. And uh, these design principles are essentially editing and production techniques that are used to emphasize the mood, the emotion, the narrative structure of the story. For instance, uh, think about how the musical score serves to highlight the speech in the example uh, I'll play next. So think again about the music. I ran down a list of recent crimes looking for a conviction that might stick. Setting fire to a reportedly flame-proof Halloween costume. Stealing a set of barbecue tongs from an unguarded patio. Altering the word hit on a list of rules posted on the gymnasium door. Never did it occur to me that I might be innocent. You might want to take your books with you, the teacher said. And your jacket. You probably won't be back before the bell rings. So what are the steps and principles involved in creating this kind of musical underlay for the story? Since I use that story in one of my classes, huh. um, they have mixed feelings about his work. Uh -huh. Hearing yeah. his voice makes a difference. So yeah. there must be some projective cues, like if you know the work, mm -hmm. if you know the story, if you know the music. Mm -hmm. Have you given some thought to that? Yeah, so we have been thinking a little bit about the performance, the, the way that uh, speakers speak, and how those, how they do things to their voice to emphasize certain parts of the story. <laughs> um, it's not in the work that I'll show you today. Uh, when you said mood, those design yeah. principles, like mood, emotion, yeah. that's a very emotional type for that yeah. little boy. Yes. That's why I use that. In, yeah, in no, and, and, and that's totally right. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of the emotion and the mood is set through the speaker's voice and the way, you know, the, the, yeah. the cues that he, he uses. Um, it's, it's not something that we address in this work. We're, we're focused on the music here. But, uh, but I think it is very important. Um, so, um, what are the steps and principles for the music? That's the question here. 
Well, the first step is to select a point in the speech that we want to emphasize. And here I'm going to choose the word, uh, well, the point right after the word innocent because it marks an important change in the overall mood of the story. Never did it occur to me that I might be innocent. You might want to take your books with you, the teacher said. So next, we have to consider the music. And uh, to highlight the emotion in the speech, we want to find an exciting change point in the music. So here, the music starts with just the rhythm. And then the change occurs when the keyboard comes in. And uh, I think you'll hear that. Now, the third step is designed to give the listener time to reflect on what was just said. So we separate the speech at the emphasis point, and we align the music change point to occur just after the speech pauses. And finally, we adjust the volume of the music to start low and then crescendo at the change point, play at full volume during the gap, and then fade down. Setting fire to a reportedly flame-proof Halloween costume. Stealing a set of barbecue tongs from an unguarded patio. Altering the word hit on a list of rules posted on the gymnasium door. Never did it occur to me that I might be innocent. You might want to take your books with you, the teacher said, and your jacket. You probably won't be back before the bell rings. So each of these steps is very, very time consuming, right? And, and, and not only that, they're time consuming, but they also require production design skills. You need to know about the principles for creating this kind of effective score. So we've built tools that facilitate all four of the steps, uh, but I don't have time to talk about all four of the tools. And so I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about how we help with step two, which is finding this music change point. Um, and so uh, music change points are characterized by strong changes in tempo or dynamics, instrumentation, or harmonic content. You're looking for a strong change. And usually a producer has to listen to a piece of music multiple times in order to identify these, these, uh, these change points. And so this is, again, very tedious, a lot of scrubbing back and forth through this music, listening to it over and over. So fortunately, computer music researchers have developed signal processing techniques that uh, can help us algorithmically find the change points. And they've developed features that correspond to changes in tempo, dynamics, instrumentation, and so on. And so our uh, algorithm is, is really a multi-scale algorithm. It computes the maximum differences in these features, first at a coarse scale, and then at a finer scale. And in the end, it returns the top three strongest change points in the music. And so it does it all automatically, and you can just find the change point by, by, uh, by pressing a button rather than having to scrub through the music. So here's our interface in action. Um, and we start by choosing a speech track, in this case, a reading of Great Expectations. And um, I mark an emphasis point in the speech. Then I select a music track. Uh, here I'm going to select uh, a song called Tenuous Gears by the band Damiac. And finally, I go over and press this automate underlay button. It generates the underlay automatically. Uh, and it does this by finding the strongest change point and then uh, aligning the music and the speech and adjusting the volume. So it, it automatically takes care of all of the steps. And then I can listen to the, to the, to the result and uh, decide if it sounds good, I can also press this next button, and that generates the underlay for the next strongest change point. And the nice thing about this tool is that it, re it removes a lot of the work that's required to create an underlay, and I can very quickly test different change points in the music until I find the best one. 
I can also try different pieces of music. So the design iteration is really sped up a lot, and that's really important for uh, being able to quickly find the best design. So let's listen to the result. Who gave up trying to get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle? I am indebted for a belief I religiously entertain that they had all been born on their backs with their hands in their trouser pockets and had never taken them out in this state of existence. Ours was the marsh country down by the river within, as the river wound, 20 miles of the sea. Okay, here I'm going to go back to David Sedaris. Setting fire to a reportedly flame-proof Halloween costume. Stealing a set of barbecue tongs from an unguarded patio. Altering the word hit on a list of rules posted on the gymnasium door. Never did it occur to me that I might be innocent. You might want to take your books with you, the teacher said, and your jacket. You probably won't be back before the bell rings. And here I'm going to stick to Sedaris, but I'm going to change the music just to show you how completely different music can really alter the mood of the story. Setting fire to a reportedly flame-proof Halloween costume. Stealing a set of barbecue tongs from an unguarded patio. Altering the word hit on a list of rules posted on the gymnasium door. Never did it occur to me that I might be innocent. You might want to take your books with you, the teacher said. And your jacket. You probably won't be back before the bell rings. All right, so to evaluate these results, we asked people who uh, listen to, to radio and podcasts quite a lot to rate 26 of our underlays. And uh, they evaluated the timing and the dynamics of, uh, of these things. And overall, they were satisfied with about 86% of our results. So, so we were pretty happy with this. Um, more importantly, we've combined this uh, this project on adding the musical score to the transcript-based editing approach that I showed you earlier. And this is really designed for audio stories. Uh, and this is our interface uh, with the raw speech for an audio story that uh, appeared on Studio 360. So again, this is the raw speech. Okay. He's not just a fan. Whenever Bullwinkle makes an appearance these days, that's Keith Scott by it. Ugh. He's not just a fan. All right, so you can see that it has all of these mistakes still in it. Uh, there's no music and so on. And uh, in our case, the transcript view shows the text as well as tokens for pauses and breaths. And pauses and breaths are really important for making audio sound natural. Now, uh, bef as before, our system allows cut, copy, paste to edit the audio, but it also incorporates additional design principles. So first, uh, it is really important for speech to sound natural after an edit. And uh, one of the things that we provide is a tool for inserting pre uh, breaths and pauses. Uh, and again, these are important to make it sound natural. Second, uh, the raw, in the raw footage, uh, a speaker will often try out different phrasings or voicings of a line. And so we provide a tool that uh, uh, collects together all of the repeated takes and groups them to uh, make it easy to listen to the different versions and select the best one. And then finally, uh, we also have a tool for recomposing the music uh, to smoothly align its change points with multiple emphasis points in the speech. And here we're essentially resynthesizing the musical track. Um, here's the interface in action. Uh, I edit some speech. I'm basically cutting some speech out. I'm looking at several different voicings, choosing one, uh, editing more speech, adding an emphasis point, a second emphasis point, asking it to construct the musical score. And, uh, He's not just a fan. This is the result. Whenever Bullwinkle makes an appearance these days, that's Keith Scott behind the antlers. And unofficially, he's the closest thing to a Bullwinkle historian. In episode 
one, Bowwinkle sets off an international incident when a pie he's making turns out to be the recipe for a super powerful jet fuel, which naturally attracts the attention of super spy Boris Badenov. <laughs> Doomsday Okay, so that gives you a sense of what the, what the tool can do. Now, uh, I want to take a step back uh, briefly here and just focus on the methodology we, we used in this project. We started by identifying design principles for effective audio stories, and we did this by observation and also looking at prior publications. We then instantiated the design principles into algorithmic tools and techniques, and, uh, and what we really did here was we took these high-level design principles that are meant for human editors and turned them into uh, lower-level algorithms. And finally, we validated the results by uh, uh, doing these kind of user feedback studies. And uh, this is a very general approach. A few years ago, we wrote a paper that kind of describes the approach in more detail um, and uh, applica various applications of it from our work. And so if you're interested in this, uh, check out the, the paper. Uh, I think there are many, many more different places where this approach can be applied, and uh, I'm very excited about that. <laughs>